Come on, come up here real quick, Steve. While, while we're waiting for to get the last bit of this up here, I see that you you have uh, you have a name M fifty two go. Can you give us? How did this name happen? I like to talk to nerds about how they got their nerd names. So how did you get this name? Oh, it's it's not nerdy at all. Actually, it's from before I was a nerd. I was a really big uh, car fan, a big fan of cars, and so it's it's named after a car. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not not interesting. Okay. Well, you know, that, it's a slightly disappointing story, but at least at least it's uh, it's not nerdy. Well, it's car nerdy, but it's not it's car not nerdy. nerd nerdy. So we are ready to begin. You can go ahead and grab that clicker and do clicker things with it, and take this mic and do microphone things with it. So I'm gonna pass this off to Steve. Let's give him a great big hand. It's kind of a mediocre hand. Let's give him a great big hand. There we there we go. Let's get some cheers. All right. Thanks, Diego. Hi everyone, my name is Steve. I contribute to the BISC network. BISC is a decentralized Bitcoin exchange network. So uh, unlike other so-called decentralized exchanges you may have heard of, BISC is uh, it's software that you run on your own machine that when you run it, you become a part of the BISC peer-to-peer -peer network and that's where all trading activity takes place. So there is no website that facilitates this activity. Everything happens over the software. Uh, the contributor network is decentralized. Uh, so there is no company. Everybody who contributes has their own roles to uh, propel the network forward. And BISC's dispute resolution mechanism is also, as of about two months ago now, also decentralized, which is what I'd like to talk about today. So just for some background, I'm going to start off by uh, talking about dispute resolution on uh, other types of peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So we'll start off by just briefly going through peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading without an exchange, just you know, informally. If, one, if, if I was to meet up with one of you and just exchange Bitcoin informally, uh, what, we, what we could do in that case of a dispute there. Uh, and then we'll talk about the decentralized exchange model of dispute resolution and how that's typically handled. And then we'll, uh, I think the meat of the talk will be on how BISC, well, what I like to think of as an exchange network, how BISC handles it and how that works. So for no exchange, if you were to meet up with somebody in a park or online or Telegram or whatever it is, however people transact uh, with Bitcoin, informally, other cryptocurrencies informally, you're typically on your own. Uh, you're engaging with the other person in good faith, hoping that they'll uh, do the trade in good faith, and if any issues come up, that they'll resolve the problem as best they can. If that doesn't work, then you could, in theory, engage the court system, uh, press a case, get a lawyer, go to court. Um, now, obviously, this is mostly too expensive, too impractical, and probably ultimately too unpredictable to really uh, to work in practice. Um, but I just wanted to note it as a, uh, that it's there as an option. The court systems in general have a lot of issues, but they have worked quite well over the years to bring about uh, stability and law in uh, you know, bringing about a relatively orderly society. With the decentralized exchange model, uh, some uh, names you've probably heard of, uh, the local Bitcoins, the, uh, what else, HODL, HODL, um, tend to employ a, and, and actually BISC until recently, uh, tend to employ a two of three multi-signature escrow setup, whereby deposit funds are sent to a two of three multi-sig escrow. So, um, the keys belong to both the peers and a third party, uh, usually the exchange. So the exchange will have some kind of an arbitrator or dispute handling agent who will have that third key in case there is an issue, they'll evaluate the situation and sign the funds over as they, as they deem appropriate. That decision is authoritative. So if you have any issues with the way the a decision was made or the way the funds were allocated, you're pretty much out on your own. And another downside of this, of this setup is the uncertain legal standing 
uh, with a third key, the exchange operator takes the risk of being in the position of having an influence over the allocation of funds, which we're not really sure at this point where that stands from a legal or regulatory standpoint. But it is something that's noteworthy that I think might become a problem in the future. Which brings us to BISC and the new way of dispute resolution that it's recently implemented. The two of three multi-sig escrow becomes a two of two escrow, where the keys belong only to the traders, the peers who were involved in the trade. And dispute resolution then becomes handled by trader chat and then two methods of escalation, which I'll talk more about in a second. But I want to note these percentages. So I'll be spending probably most of the time on mediation and refund agents. But I want to note before we even start that once the bugs are ironed out and this system works well, chat and mediation should account for the vast majority, 99% of, uh, of dispute resolution. The last uh, means of obtaining a refund agent should be rare, exceedingly rare, no more than 1% or you know, one, one case a month or something really, really rare. Um, but let's start out, start out with uh, the first step, trader chat. So this is not really a dispute resolution mechanism. It's really, well, I mean, it is, but it's just chat. If you have an issue with your trader, with your peer, open up a chat and have a chat. Um, we've had this now for a couple of months. I think the first three years that BISC was in operation, there was no chat. Uh, and so small issues, honest problems, uh, just things that could be easily resolved by just talking to the other person uh, are now easily resolvable by chat. This is end-to-end -end encrypted, highly private, highly secure. You're not leaking any metadata or anything by using it. Um, and so that's pretty much what that is. The next means or medium of dispute resolution, in case chat doesn't work, in case you're not able to get along with the other person, in case uh, the person is unresponsive, click this button, get support, and you can engage a mediator. Now, a mediator, in this case, is a person who knows the rules of trading on BISC very well. So they'll look at your situation, and they'll make a suggestion. And they'll suggest, OK, one peer should receive this much, the other peer should receive this much. Because they don't have a key in the multisig, the suggestion does not have any power on its own. But by clicking on the accept button, each peer is signing the payout transaction as suggested. And if both peers accept and sign that suggestion, payout is made and the dispute is solved. As I mentioned before, this should cover, once the system is smoothed out, this should cover the vast majority of all cases. In the several or three years now that, we've, uh, that the BISC network has been in operation, I don't recall too many cases of there being disagreement over the amount of a payout. It's mostly like, oh, I was deemed guilty when I was supposed to be innocent, that kind of thing. Payout amounts are not usually too big of a point of, um, of contention. So this should work most of the time. Yeah, and I just want to note here that the whole point of these first two steps, chat and mediation, is to encourage traders to resolve this dispute on their own. As mentioned, they're the only people who have any kind of control over the funds in that uh, multi-sig. So uh, the quickest and most efficient way of resolving disputes is to do as much as possible to help them help themselves. The third and final and hopefully rare uh, way of resolving disputes on BISC with the new dispute resolution mechanism is to engage a refund agent and the BISC DAO. Now, before I go any further, I want to just uh, make a quick note on the DAO. Uh, this is not the DAO that you're probably thinking of if you haven't heard about the BISC DAO before. Um, I'm having a full talk on what the BISC DAO actually is and how it works tomorrow evening as a part of the About Freedom uh, assembly. So you're more than welcome to attend that to see exactly how that works. 
Um, in this case, for this talk, all you have to know is that the BISC DAO is a consensus-driven tool to govern the financial state of the BISC network. Um, what that means in practice is uh, that the BISC DAO is basically a, an economic system for the BISC network itself. So when you do work for BISC, you earn some of BISC's colored Bitcoin called BSQ. You earn some of that. And when you trade on BISC, you can, if you want, use BSQ to spend uh, to, to pay trading fees. So there's a, an internal economy of BSQ creation for people who deserve it through work on the BISC network um, and for people who use it to consume the service of the BISC network itself. Um, this is important because the refund agent is going to look at the dispute case and front the Bitcoin for the person that he thinks deserves it. So obviously, he doesn't have any kind of control over the funds in the multisig. So he's going to go around that, and he's going to look at the case, reevaluate the case again, and pay, front the Bitcoin to the person that he thinks deserves it, and then make a reimbursement request to the DAO for the Bitcoin that he paid to the trader. Now, this might be a little uh, right. So front the Bitcoin, request reimbursement from the DAO. Now, the only reason that this guy would front the Bitcoin is if he's confident he's going to be paid back. Which brings me back to what I was just saying about the DAO and how it works through consensus. The refund agent is only going to front Bitcoin if the case is, if it's clear that the person that he paid the Bitcoin deserves the Bitcoin. Because when he requests recompensation from the DAO, he's going to have to say, I paid Bitcoin to this user for this reason. This was the case. These were the, the circumstances. And the voters in that cycle of the BISC DAO are going to look at that request, evaluate it manually. There's nothing automated about the DAO, although it's decentralized autonomous organization. All actions on the DAO are human actions. People voting in the DAO are going to look at this reimbursement request and evaluate whether or not it was a worthy use of DAO funds. And this, this is cut off. But this is a, uh, an overview of the full process. So, oh, that's what I wanted to mention back here. So until now, the process has been for the user, although I know this is a lot of words and uh, maybe a convoluted process, uh, for the user, it's relatively simple and, and straightforward. Chat is just a simple chat interface. Mediation click a button to engage it, and then accept or reject another button. And if that doesn't work, click another button to engage a refund agent and receive Bitcoin. It's basically just pressing buttons and receiving Bitcoin. Um, but in reality, behind the scenes, things are a bit more complicated. I'm not going to go through all of this. We've actually gone through everything on this side in the colored boxes we already talked about. Um, but the key to this process that I haven't mentioned yet is here at the top, which is cut off. But basically, this, the process starts up at the top. This, the, the top two boxes are the, uh, the beginning of the trade. Um, so the left box is send funds to two of two multisig, which we've already mentioned. The right box is sign a delayed payout transaction that sends the funds in the two of two multisig essentially to the DAO. Okay? So what's happening is that at the beginning of the trade, we're making the assumption that within a reasonable amount of time, the traders will come to a, an agreeable solution. So in the case of if you're trading Monero, that's 10 days. If you're trading fiat, that's 20 days, because fiat trades tend to take a little bit longer. But after that time has gone by, this payout transaction becomes publishable. If that transaction is published, the funds in that multisig address are sent to the BISC DAO. 
which is where the, arbit the refund agent will request reimbursement. So basically, the funds are being sent to the DAO uh, to, in a sense, increase the balance of funds in the DAO so that it can pay back the funds through the refund agent later. Um, there's a little bit more to the process. You can't send plain BTC to the DAO. You have to first convert it to BSQ, which is the purpose of the, of the donation address. Um, and yeah, the arbitrator is going to receive BSQ from the DAO because the DAO can only handle BSQ. And then he's going to get the BSQ back, sell it for BTC um, to replace the BTC that he paid to the aggrieved trader. But that's pretty much how it works. It's um, decentralized the trust. I think that the trust component is necessary. If you're going to have two traders exchange, uh, two, two strangers do an exchange, uh, you're going to have to trust somebody to uh, resolve a dispute when it comes up. The difference is that in this case, you're not trusting one party to both make a good decision and allocate the funds properly, that responsibility has been spread out over a couple of different people. And um, you're pushing, basically you're pushing the peers to resolve the dispute on their own. If they can't do that, then you're engaging the refund agent who works through the DAO. Um, but of course, the complexity of all that has been abstracted so that typical users don't have to worry about it. So. Uh, that's all I have. Anybody questions? <laughs>